www.democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Maté. New details have emerged about two Secret Service agents accused of drunk driving into a White House security barricade. The Washington Post reports the agents allegedly drove through an active investigation directly next to a suspicious package, which had been placed on the ground by a woman who claimed it was a bomb. While officers at the scene wanted to arrest the agents and administer sobriety tests, a superior ordered their release without the tests. The Secret Service's new director, Joseph Clancy, appointed last month after a scandal over a White House security breach, said he learned of the incident five days later. The agents have been identified as Mark Connolly, the second in command on Obama's security detail, and George Ogilvie, a top supervisor in the Washington field office, who issued a statement last year touting the agency's zero politics tolerance policy for driving. Well, we're going to turn now to another Secret Service incident that raises disturbing questions. On October 3rd, 2013, an unarmed African-American mother named Miriam Carey drove to Washington, D.C., from Connecticut with her infant daughter in the back seat. A U-turn at a checkpoint followed by a car chase led to Secret Service agents and Capitol Police firing 26 bullets at her car, eventually killing her. While the shooting deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown have sparked nationwide protests against police brutality, Carrie's case remains shrouded in a fog of misinformation. Initial reports claim she, quote, rammed White House and Capitol barriers, that she tried to breach two security perimeters. Those reports have since been proven false. Well, for more, we're joined by three guests. Here in New York, we're joined by Valerie Carey, one of Miriam's sisters. We're also joined by Eric Sanders. He's a civil rights lawyer and retired New York City police officer who's representing the Carey family and their wrongful death claim. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by David Montgomery, a staff reporter for The Washington Post. Last year, he wrote a piece for The Washington Post Sunday magazine called How Miriam Carey's U-Turn at a White House Checkpoint Led to Her Death. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Tell us how you think this picture um, of what took place in October fits into the larger issues that are really riling up people around the country of uh, the wrongful death, particularly of African Americans. This reminds me when I was still in law school, we talked about the U.S. Patriot Act, and it says, do you anticipate what's going to happen in the future? And I remember when 9-11 happened, that was one of the things that almost made me go back into the police department because I just retired. And I remember we were talking about how this is going to be the uh, venue or the mechanism that's going to allow people's rights to, to get violated. And that's what's happened. we become militarized because of the guise of terrorism. So now you have more and more people being shot and killed by the police officers because they're simply overreacting to everything. I mean, if you just look at the things and you see the shootings in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and California, and Cleveland, you know, not mention all these different people's names, it's the same problem. The police officers are uh, not trained properly. They're overreacting to simple street confrontations, which generally should be handled with really no, no uh, excessive force, no shootings. They're not using their impact weapons. Well, isn't it's another a, name for police problem. officer, peace officer? Well, that's one of the things, you know, you're trained to deal with this. And, well, we already know from the previous U.S. Secret Service hearings, part of the problem is training is not taken seriously. There's one training in 2012 and one in 2013. That simply is not enough if you're dealing with street encounters and you're talking about uh, protecting people's rights. So it's a larger problem, which is what I talked about Congress should have hearings to deal with this because this is a nationwide problem. It's interesting. Uh, Miriam was raised in the pink houses of Brooklyn, same place where a Kai Gurley uh, unarmed man was shot last year in a stairwell by an officer. But there was a probe by prosecutors uh, last, uh, last year, and they found that there was not enough evidence to indict the officers. What's your response to that conclusion? Well, in that case, he actually got indicted. It was an Asian officer that did get indicted to NYPD. He got indicted because what ha he claimed, uh, well, look. Anyone who's done verticals in a housing developments understand that there's people that walk in and up and down the stairs. You have to be careful. You know, listen, part of the problem is a larger context problem we have with police officers. Police officers is not business, is not for everyone. We have too many people that don't belong in a business. You know, every confrontation with a person shouldn't result in people getting arrested, people assaulted, people shot and killed. Because most of these street encounters, if you know how to diffuse them with your voice, the most powerful tool you have is your brain and your voice, connecting those two together. Unfortunately, we're not using that now. We're going, the person that listened to me, I'm going to force them. And that's what happened with Miriam Carey. My theory is that 
he got upset, this first guy, and said, who's this person hit me with that car? And then it became the now machismo. Explain. All right. Now All right. explain. Mm -hmm. When she went into this area, explain what the area was where he then put a fence in front of her. She right. didn't crash through a fence. Right, which I said is illogical from the beginning. It's the E15th Street entrance over there. And I said from the beginning, the reason why this happened, because the police officers weren't doing their job. They were too busy, as they say, in the military, smoking and joking. How is she able to drive past the area? Because there's a, a guard booth there. She drove right past them. And then now they're chasing her vehicle because what cops do, oh, my God, I miss it. Now they overcompensate. So she makes a U-turn, and she comes back out. There's no law violated at that point. So now she tries to leave, and she sees this male with a cooler in his hand, a black T-shirt, a black shirt and shorts. No uniform. No uniform. And, and it's clearly established that police officers must establish their authority. You know, people are not supposed to assume that you're a police officer. You know, they have authority. The Supreme Court has talked about that in numerous cases over and over again. It's the police officer's obligation to identify himself to the citizen, because the citizen is under no obligation to stop under any authority unless you have a legal basis, of course. Mm -hmm. She tries to leave. She tries to go around the car. And he jumps in front of her car with this bicycle rack, which makes no sense. So then people claim she rammed it. There's no ram. And we have to be careful how words are used here. There's no ram. Ram is presupposing someone intentionally runs into it. It's a big difference between someone who's trying to get past you and get around it, and you get struck as a result of your negligence as opposed to a person intentionally ramming you. And then this chase ensues. If you know the area, there's probably a good 50 or 60 cameras in that whole area, because I walked the area three times. And I observed the police a number of times. And even since that incident, I watched them all smoking and joking, talking on their cell phones, and playing all these different games, which is why you keep having these repeat breaches. No one wants to talk about that, but that's what's really going on in Washington, D.C. So when they confronted her, or at least they tried to stop her, part of the reason why, because they weren't following protocols. The police departments, all police agencies, and we love to think police officers are different, they're all the same. It doesn't matter where from New York, Washington, we all have the same consistent training. The vehicle's a little bit different. The ammunition may be a little different, the calibers, but this training, we all train with each other, so they're interchangeable. So, and, yeah, so can ahead. you talk about why you think Miriam was in Washington, something that has been unexplained by her family, not knowing what was going on with I, her? I have, no, I have no idea. Frankly, I don't care. She's a U.S. citizen. She had every right to be in Washington, D.C., just like I pick up and fly to Miami. I fly to Puerto Rico. I go where I want to go, because this is a free country. Last time I checked, we don't have to explain why she was there. We certainly can't have her explained now, because she's dead now. The question is, why did the police use the force more than why she's in Washington, D.C.? And what about why you feel she didn't stop at any point? I have no idea. I can't answer that question. But I know from experience, and anyone who's ever driven on a highway can see this, a police officer stopped on the side, and a person comes around the corner, they're speeding, driving down the highway, and they see the police officer, <gasps> they step on it, brakes hard. Why? Because they're conscious. People are afraid. They're intimidated by police officers for all mm -hmm. kinds of reasons. Have nothing to do with if they're ever going to have a confrontation, but they think they're going to get stopped, they don't want to get a ticket. That's not unique to anyone. It's, it's even us as police officers. We go out as a police officer. First thing we're doing is getting our ID out, so just in case we get stopped. So who knows why? But we know one thing. You have to have a legal basis to stop someone. David Montgomery of The Washington Post, uh, your piece goes into Miriam Carey's uh, personal issues. She was diagnosed with postpartum depression after the birth of her daughter. Can you talk about this, and is it relevant that's to this? Uh, that's inaccurate? She was not diagnosed. And see, that's part of what the problem is. She was not diagnosed. There are no medical records to support the position that she is diagnosed as postpartum depression, period. David Montgomery, do you want to respond to that? I worded it in my story as... Is, uh... Uh, another of Miriam's sisters and her mother told uh, reporters that shortly after the incidents that, that she had been uh, diagnosed with postpartum depression and psychosis. And uh, I asked the family for, Eric can tell you, medical records, and they um, uh, aren't available. I don't think, uh, I don't, I'm not sure Eric even has them. So it's two family members say that not doctors, two family members say that, that, that Miriam told them that she had been diagnosed that way. Did you want to add to that, Valerie? No, actually, there's nothing to add to it. Um, I have no personal knowledge of my sister being diagnosed, and there are no uh, documents to support that. Mm -hmm. What do you want to see happen? I 
along with my mother, would uh, like to see justice, would like to have some transparency. Uh, we still, to this day, do not know the names of the officers involved in the incident. There are a lot of questions that are still surrounding. And the previous initial reports that um, came out about my sister ramming a White House gate or breaching a White House, which were false, um, it would be nice if those publications did a follow-up to actually tell the truth. You think they should retract those original pieces? Absolutely. And David Montgomery, what you're doing now over at The Washington Post, your piece um, uh, now and Jennifer Gonnerman's piece over at Mother Jones, these are the pieces that are now looking back. But what sunk into the consciousness of the American people, because it was repeated so many times, so many reporters on television, uh, in print, uh, told this other story. Uh, exactly. And, and um uh, starting the day it happened, there was a press conference. This is the last time the Secret Service or the Capitol Police really ever addressed this publicly. And there was also the D.C. police chief. She's the one who used the phrase that Miriam Carey attempted to breach two secure perimeters. I'm not quoting her exactly, but two, two perimeters and breach was her verb. And there was, there was, it turns out there was only one perimeter that she crossed, and we don't know what her intention was. That's the one at the White House. Um, the words ramming and crashing and gates. I think some loose language was used um, in, in some media and in some headlines. And um, it, it's what we, what we said earlier. The only th barrier that she struck was that one that was thrown up to keep her from exiting. Um, when people hear the word White House gates, I think uh, most of the public pictures the famous black fence that if you crash through that gate, you're on the front lawn of the White House. She was at this outer, outer perimeter where there, there isn't a gate, there's a kiosk. And if she, if she had the intention to reach the physical building of the White House, there are at least two more hard perimeters, two more fences, barricades, that it would have been impossible for the car to, to, to get through. And I think so. And I think in journalistic shorthand, people hear the word stopped at White House gate or hit a barrier at, at, the, at the white, outside the White House. Um, I think people had different pictures in their minds that when you uh, that may not have been precisely fit the reality of what happened Valerie the personal impact on your family what is it like for your family to lose a loved one and then see uh, false or misleading or, or misleading information like this being spread about her um, I really can't articulate the feeling it's something that we live with every day and each time um, a story that was put on the wire pops up again on Twitter or on Facebook or any social media outlet, and it's just regurgitated. What happens is that the wound, it hasn't closed, so it just continues to uh, sear into your memory, and you know that this is wrong, and you're speaking, but no one's actually hearing you. How's Miriam's little girl? How old is she now? She's two, and she's without her mother. Well, I want to thank you all for being with us, and our condolences to you thank and you. your family. Valerie Carey, one of the sisters of Miriam Carey, and Valerie herself is a retired uh, police sergeant. We also have been joined by Eric Sanders, a retired New York City police officer who now is an attorney representing the Carey family in a wrongful death claim. And David Montgomery joining us from The Washington Post, staff reporter there. Last year, he wrote a piece for the Sunday magazine of The Washington Post called How Miriam Carey's U-Turn at a White House Checkpoint Led to Her Death. Uh, and we will link to that, as well as Jennifer, Jennifer Gonnerman's new piece and Mother Jones called The Wrong Way. Marion Carey drove through a White House checkpoint and died in a hail of bullets. Her infant in the back seat was a Secret Service screw-up to blame. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Maté.